thank you for joining us on the midweek edition of Journalist Hangout. I'm Ayo Dili Uzubahu. Today on the program, feeding communities in Zango Kataf, sign peace pacts and forgive, and forgive killings, rekindle hope of lasting peace in Southern Kaduna. And later on the show, Journalist Hangout midweek special is on the rising cost of food and worsening hunger in the land. I'll be hanging out with Babajide Koladi Otstoju while Ganekai de Balogo will be joining us via Skype. So if you're ready, let the hangout start now. Thank you for joining us. Fostering peaceful and unified communities is the wish of the people of South and Kaduna. Hence, aimed at achieving this, deserve applause. Feeding communities in Zanguka Tav local government area of Kaduna State come together to sign a peace treaty at a peace summit, ATF Fulani, and Hausa communities condemned the destruction and killings done in the past and decided to forgive past misdeeds. The treaty, signed by representatives of the communities, rekindled hope of lasting peace in the troubled southern Kaduna. This is a welcome development as we've been on this since um, Monday and um, in our own intervention and we we continue with it. And what do you make of this whole peace, situation uh, now with, that we have a peace pact that has been signed? Yes, it's significant. It's um, very encouraging um, that we can have this kind of uh, a desire for peace. This is where it all starts. Every dispute gets resolved in this manner. And it's significant that the traditional ruler of uh, the Atap chiefdom called his subjects. And his subjects are made up of Hausa, Fulani, uh, the Atap people, and other people resident in that chiefdom. And he called them to a meeting. I want peace. I want us to resolve and put an end to the killings that have been taking place in this area because the killings that have been reported from Satan Kaduna in the last few weeks have been in that area. And significantly, the youths who are always blamed for these killings, they were all part of the agreement, they were part of the peace uh, deal, and they decided to forgive themselves. The Kataf walked up to their house of uh, brothers, because I tend to see them as brothers. All this talk that, oh, these are our guests. I don't believe in it. You are brothers. Walked up to them and said, forgive us for what had happened in the past. And the uh, house of Fulanese too said, forgive us for whatever we have done in the past to make you angry. So they all agreed. AVM uh, 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 Shekari she, 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 she was chairman of the Peace Party. So it's a good thing coming at this time because we have been talking about Southern Kaduna for weeks. We then decided that, okay, let us even look at it. Just single Southern Kaduna as a part of Nigeria where peace is needed. But it's, it's significant and it's uh, something that makes one happy that this is coming. We just need to encourage them to build upon it. Let the different communities in that area, in Southern Kaduna, uh, build on what has happened. Let the different communities come together and at the end of the day we'll have peace and everyone will be happy. Hmm. GKB, this is quite um, interesting and um, it's like good news. The fact that I hope will work because no matter the misgivings that they have against each other, they still have to live together. Like the guest said yesterday, nobody's going anywhere. Fine, that we need to provide some form of protection for the people that call themselves indigenous people of that area. But even with that, that can be achieved by negotiation, not by killing each other. Because ultimately, psychologists will tell you that there are five steps to trauma. And acceptance is the last step. I'm glad it's accepted that their brothers and whatever they've done in the past is in the past. What's the other is for outsiders to stay away from the problem of Kaduna and let them solve their problems themselves. 
most of the problem being created from outsiders. People who think they are among them. As you can see, without the influence of anybody, they got together and decided by themselves to have peace. My prayer is that the peace will last. Hmm. All right. Joining us also is Dr. Momale Saleh. Saleh Momale, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, yes, let's quickly get your reaction to, to this whole Southern Kaduna crisis. Um, first of all, we have to give glory to God Almighty, particularly in respect to the comments you earlier made as the opening comments to this program. You know, if communities are left on their own, they have the capacity, they have the wisdom, and they have the knowledge on how best to manage their affairs. But like just the previous speaker said, external influences have played significantly into the growth of some of these issues we have been seeing. And elitist influence so much on rural communities that have minimal benefits from many of the spoils of political offices or from many of the those things for which the elite groups always fight themselves over. So it is very sad when they take such struggles to rural communities, they incite young people, and then which ultimately over time lead to some of the violence that we are seeing in some of these areas. We welcome the initiative of His Royal Highness, the paramount ruler of the area. We welcome the contributions of all the stakeholders and some of the elders of those communities who stood strongly above any ethnic or religious sentiment, who brought in all the ethnic and religious groups that exist within those territories from the grassroots and who refused to bring in external stakeholders and to sit down and discuss their own problems the way they perceive them. And ultimately, you can see just from a day's engagement, they were able to reconcile and say, yes, we have wronged each other. We have approached issues using the wrong mechanisms. And we have hurt ourselves. And we are also the victims who are licking our own wounds. Most of the other ones just go to the media and make the noise. But it is us that lost our brothers. It is us that lost our valuable assets and resources. It is us that are in this pain and this state of sorrow. Doctor. So why should how this can level we, of doctor, doctor Fallon, on Yes. How can we achieve lasting peace across the board in southern Kaduna? I, I think that is a very, very big and worthy uh, question. And addressing the need for peaceful coexistence in southern Kaduna is actually a Herculean tax, but one that is not surmountable. First of all, one of the key drivers of the violence have been the weak governance, particularly the incapacity or the incapacitation of the traditional institutions to manage the affairs of the rural communities in a fair and equitable manner as we used to have in most parts of northern Nigeria. The effectiveness of local government administrations the effectiveness of security agencies and the effectiveness of the judicial system in reconciling simple differences between individuals, between groups, has significantly declined and has remained ineffective. So the only institution that has the capacity to manage some of these local dynamics in a fair and justifiable manner are the traditional institutions. But where you have excessive influence of political actors and a lot of incitement of young people on one hand, and the growth of criminal activities beyond the capacity of community institutions to manage, this often drives some of the initial triggers of some of this violence. So for me, first and fundamental is that the community institutions have to wake up to their responsibilities of managing their own affairs. Secondly, all of these narratives, all of this stereotyping that is taking place and which is promoted by some sections of the elite need to be halted. 
they should find other mechanisms of addressing their political and economic pursuits, their contestations over the spoils of political office. They should use other mechanisms to fight that. They should allow communities to live in peace. They should stop these narratives of land occupation, these narratives of indigenous settler, these narratives that this ethnic group is favored in political appointments against the other ethnic groups. This religious group is being favored by politicians against that religious group. Let them go and fight it out in the state's houses of assembly, in the urban areas where they have this, and let them leave these communities to coexist peacefully. Thirdly, is the one that is very difficult for communities to manage on their own without support of state institutions. And it has to do with the growth of criminality. Happily, unlike in many other parts of Kaduna State, for which we all know, the, some parts of the Northern Senatorial Zone and the Southern Senatorial Zone have better security in terms of physical security and the activities of criminal elements than the central parts of Kaduna. So with this, what communities need to do is to work together more strongly and ensure that they do not create any avenue for criminals to infiltrate their territories. If you look at what is happening in local governments in central parts of Kaduna, Chukun, we are all familiar with the Kaduna Abuja Highway, kidnappings, armed robbery, cattle rustling in many parts of central Kaduna. If you go to some parts of Zaria, the surrounding environments like Makarfi, Ikara, and many of these local governments in southern Kaduna, including Zambon, Kata, parts of Kaduna, Jaba, the rate of insecurity is comparatively lower. So I will urge the communities to work with security agencies to address all these grievances and ensure that they collaborate among themselves to prevent the escalation of criminal elements and the infiltration of violent crimes into these areas. I think if these three-pronged approaches are taken and they are supported by the media, which, like you are doing, is promoting the voices of unity, the voices of inclusion, the voices of nonviolence as against the provocative violence of the elitist groups, we will go a long way in restoring all the parts of Southern Kaduna to the path of sustainable peace. Thank you. I want to thank you, thank you Dr. Dr. Saleh Mumale. Thank you. Thank you for your intervention. And Babajide, we've spoken about, uh, you know, so, peace here now. After the peace pact, we now look at sustaining the peace. Yes. Over time, we've had a situation whereby we've had this kind of, um, you know, coming together to sign a peace treaty mm -hmm. to do everything. But somehow, somehow, we've not been able to sustain it for a long time. How can this feuding communities sustain peace? The, the government and the state has to support them wholeheartedly support them with the resources at his disposal. For example, even in the communique, they ask for um, the support of the Karina Peace Commission, that the Karina Peace Commission should back them in this endeavor, should back them in this project, because I would like to call it project, mm -hmm. so that a sustainable peace can be achieved. They also said, yes, we have security um, agencies in our area, but they need to spread them evenly across board so that there is no part of the Southern uh, Carolina uh, that is not defended. There is also the issue of funding. Once you have a peace committee like this one, they set up a peace committee between Hausa Fulani, made of Hausa Fulani, as well as the Atia people. Mm -hmm. You then need to support them financially so that uh, everything that they are doing, mm. uh, you can, we can be sure that it will be successful. Because a lot of these things you cannot do without uh, having some money. Because when they set up peace committee and security committee on their own, those vigilantes have to be supported one way or the other. Mm. You know, So mm. they say eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Mm. Everyone within those areas must be mm. vigilant. Mm. So that when infiltrators come to cause trouble, 
you, 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 you know what to do, you alert the, the security agencies. Once they are committed, fully committed to this, and they are properly monitored by the government uh, at state level, I'm, I'm confident that this, this peace uh, initiative will be endured. GKB, I mean, how do we sustain the peace? Well, it has to be done on three levels. Like Jide said, the first one, of course, is to have mutual trust. Once there is trust among the parties, I'm sure they can move forward. Second one is to try as much as possible to be fair to all parties, especially when it comes to jobs and political appointments. In this wise, the chiefs must be up and doing because they must protect this peace with all their might. On three levels, like I said, the first one is security, the other one is economic, and the last one, of course, is to ensure that criminals do not infiltrate, how they can do not use that as an excuse to cause trouble. So the first thing they need to do, as well as the chiefs who are in charge of this or whoever is going to, over, to oversee this particular peace pact, is to ensure fairness at all levels. Mm -hmm. If people are going to a level and they are forced loss, make sure it is done equally or equitably or enough not to cause any bad blood between the parties. That's the only way forward because this peace will come in right now because it's politically expedient for it to be so. But to have the same peace 10 years down the line, 20 years, 20 years down the line, there must be a framework to guide them so everybody will know the role they have to play. If it's like they do in most parts of Nigeria, if a particular community presents the commissioner, another, another com community will present the House of Assembly, and that, another community will present the chairman. So there's always a way to work it out. So there'll be no need for anyone to complain of marginalization. Okay. That, to me, is the ultimate goal. Yeah. Joining us from Abuja now is um, Francis Danla de Kouza, a legal practitioner. Thank you for joining us. Thank you Thank for you joining us. Thank you very much. All right. For having me. Can you tell us about the peace move in, the, in southern Kaduna, sir? Well, I, I want to... I beg to restrict myself to the peace move in Etiap Chiefdom okay. of Zongon Katab local government area of Kaduna State. Okay. This is so because that is where I come from and that is where I am actively involved. Uh, you know, since uh, 1992, when we had the Zongon Katab crisis, we came together as a community and I agreed to live in peace. For 28 good years, we have lived in peace in a Tiap Chivdom. We had no serious breakdown of law and order or crisis in the Chivdom for the past 28 years until of recent when this crisis erupted. So, when the crisis erupted, a lot of people were killed from both sides. Both Fulani and Etia people were killed. Properties were destroyed. A lot of people were mad, and a lot of people flee for fear of being attacked. Uh, this scenario really, really was very disturbing, especially to His Highness the Ogwatia Sir Dominic Gambo Yahaya. What he now did was to do some sort of consultation of major stakeholders in the local government, in the state, and in the chiefdom. In fact, the consultation even went outside uh, the, the state. And culminatively, he arrived at the conclusion that the best way to do, to go about it, to restore peace, is to call a peace summit. And then, initially, the arrangement was don't call it, don't 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 have that peace summit in the in the chiefdom, have it outside. But again, on a second thought, they said no, let us have it within the chiefdom. And so it was resolved that we had this peace summit in the chiefdom. And so it was held on Saturday, 22nd of August, 2020, at Maryam and Yakubu Event Center in Ongwanwekili in a Tiap Chiefdom of Zongon Katab local government area. Now, the essence of that summit 
is number one, to explore ways of sustaining peace, avoiding crisis and sustaining peace in the, lo in the, in the, in the chiefdom. Uh, representatives of Fulani were there. Representatives of the Etiab were there. Representatives of the House of Fulani were there. And a host of other peace practitioners across northern Nigeria all came. And they assisted with technical know-how of how to come about this peace. So people freely discuss. And at the end of the day, we took certain resolutions, about 14 of them, aimed at sustaining the peace in the, in the local in the chiefdom. Now, first of all, what we did was we acknowledged the fact that all of us, Etiab, Hausa, Fulani, are responsible for the crisis. We have contributed one way or the other to enhancing the crisis. Mm -hmm. And so we admit that fact. All of us admitted that fact. And thereafter, we said, okay, since all of us have erred, we are human beings. The tendency is that we have erred. We have wronged people. We have hurt people. Let us apologize to those people. Let us comfort them. And that was done on behalf of the whole community. We say, we are sorry to each other. We said, for those who lost their loved ones, for those who lost properties, please accept our heartfelt condolence and accept our forgiveness and forgive us and let's forge ahead. So that was done and everybody was happy. Now, the next thing we did was, so what is the way forward? Having accepted our fault, having repented, and having asked for forgiveness, what is the next forward? We said, number one, every resident of the chiefdom dare not take law into his hands, no matter the level of provocation. Nobody should take law into his hands. Everybody should subject his grievances to mediation, either through the customary structure, traditional structure of mediation, which is already in place, or through the civil courts, which are also there. But nobody should take the law into his hand. All of us agree with that. And that anybody who takes the law into his hand, who commits any crime, will be exposed and will be reported to the security agencies for investigation, prosecution, and if possible, for conviction, so that it will serve as punishment for the wrong he has done and as deterrence for others not to commit such offenses again. We move ahead and said, every Nigerian has the fundamental or constitutional right to recite anywhere he so chooses. And this also includes a tiap chiefdom. And therefore, it was resolved that the traditional institution and the civil institution in the chiefdom should afford, should facilitate people's return to stay in the chiefdom if they so desire. Nobody who desire to come and reside in a tiap chiefdom should be denied that opportunity. They should be encouraged and nobody should be harassed, irrespective of tribe, irrespective of religion, irrespective of sex, irrespective of color. Everybody has the fundamental constitutional right to come and reside in a chapter and carry about, go about his lawful business. We agreed on that. And we move ahead to say, okay, in order to sustain this peace, let us also set up a committee. This committee is going to to, to comprise of all the major stakeholders, the Tiap, the Fulani, the Hausa, and the youth, male and female, boys and girls, married men and married women. All of them are going to come together to constitute a committee. And they are going to dialogue from time to time in order to promote peaceful coexistence. We also talked about the need for empowerment of the youth because we know that they said the idle man is the devil's workshop. Most of the youths don't have any subsidiary means of livelihood. And most of them don't have the capacity to go to a farm and farm. And so we feel that there's the need for us to have an economic empowerment program that will train the youth into various trades and empower them to be able to keep them busy so they can be able to earn a living, a decent mode of earning living.
We agreed on that. Again, we called on the government. Like, look, there is the need for us to fast track, the, for government, both the state and the federal government, to fast track the community policing pro pro program of this government so that at least the locals in the various villages will be empowered to take charge of the security of their locality. And if they do that, it will enhance uh, security and enhance peaceful coexistence. We agreed on that, and we called on government to so do, to fast track this process of community policing, because that po po program will enable the locals in the various villages to take the issue of security headlong and ensure it. So these are some of the basic things, major things that was agreed upon. And uh, uh, yesterday, the, His Highness, the Uwatiap, now decided to inform the governor about this resolution. So we took this resolution to the governor in Kaduna State, and we hand over officially this document to him and solicit his support in all ramification to ensure that these recommendations are implemented. Okay, Doc, I, I let, me, so let me just put you on hold there. When we have to take this break. When we come back, we'll talk more. It's still journalist Tanga. We'll be right back after this breather. This is Journalist Hangouts, and we are still looking at the peace process in southern Kaduna. And before we went on break, we had the legal practitioner, Francis um, Danla de Koza, talking to us about the ITF peace deal that was actually brokered last Saturday. Finally, so what should we be looking forward to, Barisa? Okay, it's a welcome development that uh, just this Saturday, uh, a part of Southern Kaduna, the Atiyah people can come together and, you know, achieve this. And we believe if every other ethnic community in within the Southern Kaduna, mm -hmm. if they embrace, they can tell these parts, that there will be a long-lasting peace. Yes, uh, this is the... This is just the beginning. And uh, this kind of uh, peace moves must be encouraged. I, I was happy when I read uh, the governor of Cardinal State expressing his joy about this peace move and praising the uh, king of the uh, kingdom uh, profusely for the role that he played in uh, bringing about peace. That is the area we've been reading about uh, for over a month, for the killings. But now they've, they've decided to come together. The governor of Kaduna State must provide the impetus. He must own this process. This is like a project. He must own it. He must monitor the uh, extent of compliance with the agreements that have been reached by both parties. He must encourage them. And at every level in all of the uh, um, areas that are prone to violence, between those groups, he must encourage this kind of peace pact to happen. He must show that the, the government believes more in achieving peace than using the military or the police to, to, to uh, bring about peace in, in, in the region. So this is what we want to see. It's, it's a good starting point, and we want to encourage the governor and his aides to work harder to ensure that we have priests across board in uh, Southern Kaduna. And um, we hope that they'll be committed to it and it's just not something that is going to be an, an exercise in futility and because over time this place has been embattled. It's not somebody was talking about 1980 yesterday and I was going to say, ah, before 1980. And there have been peace parts in the past. And All that we need to do is do our tie back to the past, find out why some of those peace parts did not endure. Mm. Now, we should now ensure that in this case, that those conditions that frustrated the peace parts in the past do not rear their ugly heads again. So it is a matter of vigilance across board. Mm. The matter, everyone must show commitment to the cause, from the governor down to the smallest man in those communities. They must show com commitment. And you saw Dr. Sarim Mamale talking about people coming from outside to come and cause trouble. 
those people, once they are sighted, they must be exposed, and the security agencies must be really on top of their game. They must uh, get down to brass tacks and deal decisively with troublemakers in, in these areas. We have a, uh, Dan Lamy Zango, a member of the um, Zango Kataf community here. Thank you for joining us. Dan Lamy. Thank you. Good evening, Ayodele. All right. Can you please just tell us um, briefly your own um, stand in this priest process? Okay. Uh, this peace process is one of the processes that we feel is just a stepping stone to solving the lingering problem that has been debating our people since the last 28 years. The peace process served as a kickstart to resolving the issue. After the crisis, the Aguatia invited us to come and discuss under a specific terms. And these terms include how do we solve this problem for now before we go into discussing the fundamental problems that have kept in the problem for so long. Because after the 1992 crisis, there is the Commission of Inquiry set up by government for the February and May 1992 crisis. They finished their report, but a white paper has not been published and it has not been implemented. Though it has been said that so many of the decisions were implemented, but some of these, some of these uh, recommendations just came by way of coincidence. But actually, there was no government white paper on those issues. Now, killing has continued because of the lingering problems. The farmlands has always been an issue. The issue of demarcation is also an issue. The citation of the Atia Chudom has also been an issue. The issue of security has been an issue. Now, how do we solve this problem once and for all? Then the, the, the Aguati have decided to say, okay, please come. For now, let's stop these killings. Because the Atiabs are killed, the houses are killed, the Zongo Kataf town was attacked, the Fulani uh, heads were attacked, and everybody has been groaning helter-skelter. Some are in IDP camps, and some have remained under curfew for over 24 hours for so long. And so the Aguati have decided that, okay, let us come and let's discuss and see how we will solve and resolve this issue for now before we now come to discuss the fundamental issues that will solve, resolve the whole issue once and for all. This is how this uh, peace summit came about. And we were there, the liberations were made, and a communique was arrived at, and all the uh, representatives of the communities signed the community. Thank you, Zango, for, the, for your efforts. We hope that this will serve as a big example to other parts of Southern Kaduna, and they will um, ensure that we have peace in our land. Thank you so much. Yes, joining us is uh, Wakili Kadiwa, a lawyer and human rights activist. He joins us via Skype. Thank you for joining us, Wakili. Thank you for having me. All right. Can you tell us ways to have lasting peace in Southern Kaduna? The ways to have peace and to de-escalate the tension is to, my mind, um, rebuild trust. And uh, as the Bible says, go to the crossroads, ask for the ancient paths, and walk in them, and you will find peace. 
when we grew up as young men in this area and all over this country, we lived in a Nigeria in the 60s and partially the early 70s, but even much earlier with so much of togetherness. So I would urge that we de-escalate the negative narratives and see if we can look back at the positive narratives of our staying together, of the partnership that have been built over the years. And, and by saying this, I would like to say some of those institutions that have been very helpful in building peace and keeping communal harmony have, by the politics that has been played out over the years, be the military politics or the return to civilian politics, have done so much to erode the powers of the traditional institutions, the local government uh, um, powers, the judicial and the security forces, and have so badly weakened them that they are certainly not in a position today to help as they should, particularly the traditional institutions. We know that so very well. Be that as it may, we like a return to such, empowering them a little bit so that they can function. And um, when we look back, as I said, it's good to have projects, joint projects, joint projects in the sense that there must be economic development projects that will engage both sides. Both sides can work in partnership. And let me give you an example. When we were growing up, if a full man came into your community and it's your own farm land that he has chosen to stay for the season, he was going to be around. You counted yourself lucky because you knew you were going to get much more grains from the manure on your farm that year. And you would likely have better harvest than other members of the community. But then it was a mutually beneficial venture in which you, the farmer, took upon yourself the buying of um, very basic things like, uh, uh, you know, what the cows would eat and having so much of relationship that was mutually beneficial. If they left that period and went somewhere to come back next season or next year, they kept all their goods in your own house and they were safe. Sometimes they would even go for years, but they would come back. So there was this mutual relationship and it was beneficial to both sides. So if we can go back to this and encourage mutual uh, developmental projects, for example, let me let you know, that we could have agro-allied um, projects that are run by the two, I mean, by the communities, herders and, uh, um, and, and, and crop farmers or whatever, mini ranches, feed, feed mills built, I'm sorry, we have to leave and, it there. and so on. So Thank such you. joint ventures. Thank you, Barista. Thank you for your intervention. And... Um, we, we hope that there will be long-lasting peace in Kaduna State. We'll take the southern, southern Kaduna. We'll take this break. When we come back, we'll talk more. It's still journalists stand out. Welcome back. Today's episode of Journalist Angar Midweek is on the rising cost of food and worsening hunger in Nigeria. In this report, TVC News' Abiola Sholanke tells us more about the biting impact of rising cost of living on the people. The novel coronavirus has had a big impact on global economies. Rising infections have led to social distancing directives, closing of businesses, travel restrictions, salary cuts, and high unemployment. Economic activities have shrunk dramatically and with it, the global food supply chain. The situation in Nigeria is not different, as the country has instituted a range of measures to curb the pandemic. These measures have affected all sectors of the economy. The ailing economy has been crippled further with grave implications for the country. 
One of the fallouts of this economic meltdown is rising inflation and exorbitant cost of living. In Nigeria, inflation has been in double digits for more than three years, due largely to a weakened currency and continued border closure. This has in turn taken a toll on food production and supply. Food prices in Nigeria surged 15.48% in July, the most since March 2018, after rising by 15.18% in June. On a monthly basis, food prices inched up by 1.52%, the most since June 2018, after increasing 1.48% in the previous month. This implies that prices have continued to rise dramatically from February till date. It is a situation that has most Nigerians worried. A lot of factors have been identified as responsible for rising inflation in the country. When there is inflation in an economy, the purchasing power of the people is reduced. Because for someone who is earning 18,000 Naira uh, pre-inflation, by the time inflation comes into being, that purchasing power, maybe what he is able to buy the previous month, is actually reduced. In the economy, for those who, in one way or the other, might have uh, taken loan, or for those who have uh, interest uh, loans, even in the banks, um, when there is an inflation in the economy, it actually reduces their power. For these economists, a lot still needs to be done to stabilize the economy. The monetary authorities should please come on board and do their duty. If they have to mop up money from the sector to be able to control inflation, they should do that. And when they need to release money into the economy, for the economy to be buoyant, they should also make sure that one is done. We should also talk to our market women and market men, if possible. The, the, the rate at incessant increment in our um, rate of uh, food prices should please in, reduce because it has adverse effect even upon the people. This is Ketu area of Lagos. Southwest Nigeria. It is famous for the hustle and bustle at its food market, but patronage has gone down. According to Alice Chuku, prices of food commodities were low a few months ago, as buyers troop in to buy things in like numbers. But now, prices are no longer within the reach of most buyers. The one that we are used to buy as uh, like a two five nine is almost eight thousand naira. We are buying it now; it's too expensive. Even the, the transport, safe, everything is too cost now. Why then? It's because of coronavirus. Everything is just hung together like that. The highest price increases were recorded in grains, tomatoes, yam, vegetable oil, condiments, vegetables, among others. Customers say we always complain and we have not even seen customers like it before again. They said that there is no money. Many traders wish they sold their wares much faster, but the reality of declining purchasing power of the average Nigerian is dawning on them. They are aware of the fact that many workers are not getting paid due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Customers, they are not happy because of the price Everything has increased. Sometimes when they come, if you tell them the price that you are selling now, they will say that before, that is not how they used to buy. They will get angry. Some of them will left, they will not buy. Some of them will buy maybe local rice. And some who don't even have money, they will buy like half derica or one cup. Because them, they don't have money. Everything is hard for them. So some, they will just get angry and say, ah, why is everything like this? That this is not how they used to buy. So they are not really happy. Uh, for the past month, uh, four months now, uh, the decrease of uh, commodities in the market is no more there again. You know, people, uh, the, the salary did not increase, but the things of the market, they increase every day by day. And uh, they will not buy much as they used to buy before. That's why everything is getting down, down. If I buy this uh, one basket, 10,000, 11,000 now, if I come straight out for this market, I'm not going to see 10,000 for inside for this one basket. If I share that for 500, if you customer will come, you tell, if you tell if customer ask the price, they say, how much this one? If you tell us, say, 500 naira, you say, this market is cost. The matter is cost. Because me, self, I go buy a market for inside my door. Now, 11,000. They called on government to implement policies that will reduce the burden on the masses. I want them to help us. 
to bring things down. The price is too much. Look at this Ororo now. We are selling bottle 500 naira because we buy it 14,005 a cake instead of 10,000 or 9,005. The price is too much. Olo ni ko sa nu wa la koko ta wa yi o. Tori opolopo wo mi gan o ti lo to pe eyan yawo ka kin sin ni. Oja yen je wa lo soke re bi pe o si kan to yan to le te si. E wa lo yawo gan kokaju e gan mo abi ko lo ko sa nu wa. This increase is all attributed to the season and something drastic needs to be done to salvage the situation. Abiola Sholanke, TVC News, Lagos. Quite worrisome. Julie, yes. somebody printed the scenario that in Nigeria we have rice processing factory in like 36 states. Mm. Right now, we're doing local bag, you know, the least you can get a bag of rice is 22,000. Locally tough. manufactured rice. It's tough. It's really tough. And, and uh, we're still producing and we've uh, increased our production. Yes, yeah, because the cost of production is high. The cost of production in terms of even yield per hectare, relative to yield per hectare, is, is not encouraging because we have to embrace more scientific means of producing rice. Mechanized. Yes, so that we can actually increase our yield per hectare. That is the edge that countries like um, Thailand. China, Thailand, and India have uh, above us. And don't also forget, those people who have uh, rice farms, they need to wet. And they need petrol. Hmm. They the need costs. petrol, yes. To wet, costs. especially in the upland area, they need to wet. And then you petrol, even petrol price has gone up. So all of this ultimately oh, then transports, cost of transportation. A lot of money gets paid to soldiers and policemen hanging on the highway. Mm -hmm. You know, once they see the food you are bringing, they mm -hmm. continue to extort with reckless abandon. And mm -hmm. it is the uh, end consumer that they will uh, push the body into. So this is what we are going through. Food prices are rising. And I'm, I'm really worried. In a lot of places where uh, criminals, bandits have not allowed farmers to go to farm, how is our food security not going to be threatened? And when we have uh, this kind of problems, what is available, the prices will go up. That's what we are facing. I'm really worried about the cost of uh, 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 food items in our, in our country. Everything is rising. And when it rises, it never comes down. Hmm. That's the problem. It's a big problem. GKB, is GKB there? <laughs> what do you make of the inflation rates, GKB? Okay, I think I have um, Barrister Awan Asan. Awan Asan on on the line. Thank you for joining us. Awan Asan, we're still Good talking evening. about Good the evening. Southern Kaduna peace process. And GKV, I, I, I want, I'm going to take you a little bit back, uh, Ayo. Yeah. I want to contribute on the Southern Kaduna program you guys have been having since Monday. In the last three days, uh, you have revealed a lot of things that uh, uh, were not out there before. Uh, uh, the balance you give the program, the, the unprecedented revelations we hear, uh, 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 especially the person that just spoke, the barrister from... Taipa local government also, a community, that uh, told us the way they reconciled themselves with the houses and Fulanis and the people living around the area. Uh, you see, these are the kind of things we should be having. These are the kind of conversations we should be having on TV mm -hmm. and, and radios and uh, broadcasting companies. We, when you give balance, you understand the problem. We thank you so much, Babajide. God will bless you. Mm -hmm. You are doing a wonderful job. Thank and you. by the grace of God, we'll see to the end of uh, this crisis in Kaduna. Thank you, Awa. Thank you, Awa. Thank you for your contribution. And um, we hope that there will be lasting peace in yes. southern Kaduna. Yeah. And um, one thank you, um, Gani. Thank you.
we have uh, is everyone uh, putting on beats yes, putting uh, on beats like somebody uh, going to ile yes, ile that's, that is uh, like somebody uh, going for uh, ida no uh, eh? are you are you about to marry another <laughs> wife or what <laughs> thank you for your intervention yeah. and that's our package today join us tomorrow for another episode of the program you can also watch john list hangout on our platform showing on the screen we're on YouTube, youtube.com slash TVC News Nigeria. Our feedback channel is journalist and at TVC News.tv. I'm Ayodili Uzubaku. See you tomorrow and God bless Nigeria.